After the completely dominant performance that Metacham put out, I was left wondering, how do the pseudo-legendaries stack up? So today and tomorrow, let's find out. In this video, I'm going to beat Pokemon Emerald with only a Salamence. Playthrough rules can be found in the description if you're new to my content. Of course, Salamence has incredible base stats. 95 HP, 135 attack, 80 defense and special defense, 110 special attack, and 100 speed. Like all other pseudo-legendaries, this thing has a slow growth rate, but I'm sure it can make up for it with its move pool. It starts with Rage, Bite, Leer, and Headbutt. That's a pretty good starting set. And then through Level Up, it gets Focus Energy, Ember, Protect, Dragon Breath, Scary Face, Fly, Crunch, Dragon Claw, and Double Edge. It's very interesting that it gets Fly through Level Up. By the way, in Generation 3, there are only two Pokemon that can do this. The other being another dragon, in that case Rayquaza. Through TM and HM it gets access to Dragon Claw, Iron Tail, Earthquake, Brick Break, Flamethrower, Fire Blast, Rock Tomb, Aerial Ace, Steel Wing, Fly, and Rock Smash. Now that I've gone through all the moves, I'm sure you'll be noticing one notable omission, and that is Dragon Dance. With how prominent that move is on the NPC's dragons, I was really expecting Salamence to learn it, but in this case it doesn't. I thought maybe it would get it through a prior evolution, but that is not the case. The only way that Salamence can get Dragon Dance in Generation 3 is to have it as an egg move. The father has to be a Charmander, Charmeleon, Charizard, Horsey, Seedra, Kingdra, Gyarados, Dratini, Dragonair, Dragonite, or Altaria. So Salamence doesn't have any setup moves, it has a slow growth rate, but it has fantastic stats and an incredibly diverse move pool. They should balance each other out, plus its typing is actually quite good. In Generation 1, 2, and 3, the Dragon type deals special type damage, and the Flying type deals physical damage. I'm going to want to a little bit more into the physical side of things if everything else is the same. However, its special attack is definitely serviceable. And that brings me to my nature selection. For this playthrough, I am using a brave nature, which boosts my attack stat and lowers my speed. I can already see the comments. Someone is going to be really upset that I did this. They are going to say that I totally threw this playthrough with Salamence by lowering its speed. You should never lower a Pokemon's speed. Actually, in a solo playthrough, this is totally fine. Salamence has way too much speed. For a solo run of the game, I would far prefer more attack. And of course, I can essentially cause that redistribution to happen using a nature. Do remember, later in the playthrough, there are a lot of stat advantages stacking up for the player that the AI doesn't have access to. If you're worried about my speed, remember, there are a lot of advantages stacking up for the player in that stat that the AI does not have access to. I'll talk about those later on when they become relevant. For now, let's talk about this run specifically. The first gym leader is Roxanne, who is a rock type specialist and does have super effective damage against Salamence, so I'm going to fight most of the optional trainers just to gain experience so that I'm well prepared for her. Bite is going to be a good answer for all of her Pokemon because dark type moves have special damage category, so I'm not going to have to rely rely on moves like Headbutt and Rage. I head north of Rustboro City, finishing off the trainers on Route 116, and then I also defeat everyone inside of the gym. With no more trainers available, I don't think it makes sense to battle wild Pokemon, this just wastes time. So let's do the first gym battle of the run. Up first is Geodude. This thing has basically no special defense. It has even less speed, by the way. So obviously Salamence moves first, hits Bite, does massive damage, and then gets hit by Rock Tomb. Alright, I tank that pretty well. She uses a potion, I finish off her lead, and then she sends in her second Geodude. Same scenario here. I take it down to low health, she heals it, I take it back down to red health, and then finish it off. It's really great that I've used up both of her potions before the Nose Pass comes out. It uses Rock Tomb, taking Salamence under half health, and also to 16 speed, which is one less than Roxanne's ace, meaning it is going to use moves block, harden, and tackle, and no more rock type moves. As a result, Salamence is easily able to finish it off and earn itself the first badge. This one gives a 10% boost to my already incredible attack stat, and I also get the TM for Rock Tomb. I'm going to teach it now, it'll be decent coverage, and I don't have to rely on it like I did with the fossils. South of the city I face Brendan. By the way, there is no starter that he could have that would be good against Salamence. The dragon type is fantastic against all of the starting types, and the flying type covers their secondary typings. I head back to Petalburg Woods. Notice 
notice here that the double battle does not fight me, that's because I haven't caught any of my HM users yet. In Emerald, all of the HM users can be caught around Petalburg City. You want a Talo or Wingull for Fly, and then a Zigzagoon and Meryl for everything else. Of these, the Meryl is the hardest to catch, and today I get to catch it in my favorite Pokeball, the Premier Ball. I love the color pairing of white and red. It just looks so good. I take Mr. Briny's ship south to Duford Island. Here I'm going to pick up the Silk Scarf. It can be useful right away to boost the power of Headbutt. After that, I head into Granite Cave, delivering the letter to Stephen Stone. By the way, I wish there was more that I could do in this location. In solo playthroughs, you just kind of go through to Stephen and then escape rope out, and it's pretty simple. Next is the Duford City Gym, and I decided to level one more time here because I was so close. There's a convenient trainer that only has a single Pokemon that I can defeat very quickly. Now, I don't think I'm going to have any problems against Brawly. Let's do this. Up first is Machop. It's a bit annoying that I don't have a flying type move at this point in the game, but Headbutt should be enough. It causes a flinch, so I knock out his lead for free. The Metatite, of course, only has Focus Punch, so as long as I just keep attacking, eventually it's going to go down. This is advantageous for another reason, because sometimes Brawly will use a Super Potion on it, which means he can't use it on the Makuhita, but that wouldn't have mattered anyways, because against the Makuhita, I flinch it not once, but twice in a row. So yeah, Brawly does absolutely no damage to Salamence. On Slipper for Beach, I pick up the typical three items, the Aether, the Soft Sand, and then the Heart Scale. I'm going to skip ahead now to when I'm facing Brendan. I do have access to Focus Energy now, and while it does take the critical hit chance up from around 6% to 25%, I didn't think it was going to be useful in this fight, and I just sweep with Headbutt. And Focus Energy is going to continue being useless, because I have been doing all of this additional training for a purpose. Once Salamence reaches level 25, it can learn Ember, and I'm going to teach this move in the place of Focus Energy. The reason that Ember is important is because I need a counter to Watson's Magneton, and with it, I have so super effective damage. After defeating trainers in the surrounding regions, Salamence is level 28, so now let's face Watson and see how this goes. He is usually one of the hardest gym leaders in the region. Up first is Voltorb. Intimidate hits it, which I guess is good if it decides to go for self-destruct but I'm faster, and Headbutt is able to one-shot it. Next is Electric. I just hope that Static doesn't activate here, and it doesn't. So I've made it to the Magneton without taking any damage or having a status condition. This means I can use Ember, doing half to the Magneton, and then heal Paralysis, knocking it out for free. So I've made it to the Manectric in a really good state. I go for Headbutt. It does more than half, activating Static, causing Paralysis. Manectric eats a Citrus Berry. I attack it, taking it to low health. Watson has two Super Potions and he tries to use them here, which is a good strategy because potentially paralysis could cause me to miss a move. That being said, even when the Manectric does get to attack, Shockwave is doing very little because it's neutral against Salamence. After how this battle went, it feels pretty inevitable that Salamence takes an easy victory on its first attempt. It still has no resets. Now the victory over Watson provides the player with a 10% boost to their speed stat, which is basically making up for my nature's deficit. I also thought that Salamence would learn Shock wave. After all, in Generation 1, Dragonite learns like every elemental TM, but it doesn't in fact. It gets no electric type moves. Well, unless you're counting Hidden Power, which today I have set to Hidden Power Electric. I'll talk about why I did that a little bit later. In the next section of the game, Salamence has a chance to learn Protect, but obviously that's not going to be a good move for it. After all, it's not a water flying type. On the other side of the fiery path, I make a choice regarding my moveset, which is not to teach secret power. You will note though that I am talking to the guy to get the TM. This is specifically so the TM shop in Slateport City will offer hidden power. I don't want to have to come back here later in the game, that would just be a major inconvenience and a waste of time. Alright, so let's take a gondola ride up to the top of Mount Chimney and face Maxi. The fight starts off with two Intimidates, with both of us having our attack stat lowered. It matters less for his Mightyena though, because it knows no physical moves. Also, Headbutt is just barely not able to two-hit it as a result, so I'm using Ember instead. I could get a burn, which would speed the fight up a little bit. In the end, it doesn't matter. I move on to the Zubat, one-shotting it with Rock Tomb, and it's now time for his ace, Camrupt. This thing's best move against Salamence is Tackle, so I'm gonna knock it out, but the game conveniently speeds things up for me, giving Salamence a critical hit. With that wrapped up, it is time for my fourth gym battle. 
So Flannery is uh, going to be completely awful against Salamence. This thing feels so dominant in the early game, by the way. I'm just going to one-shot both the Nummel and the Slugma. Camrupt comes out, and it doesn't really have any good options either. Plus, I just flinch it and take it down for free. Okay, so Torkoal is next. What is it going to do? Probably use Body Slam, and yes, that is what it's doing. Salamence shrugs these hits off like they don't matter at all. I do get paralyzed, which is kind of annoying. I guess I could have taken a Cherry Berry into this fight if I had anticipated anticipated that the Torkoal was going to be the only problem. Also, I want to mention the fact that I did not use Rock Tomb very much during this fight. That's just because it has lower accuracy, and I think that hitting every turn with Headbutt and having the chance to flinch is just a little bit more reliable. In this case though, I don't think it would have mattered what I did. Salamence takes an easy victory over Flannery. The price for this gym battle is the TM for Overheat, and this one is similar to Shockwave because Salamence can't learn it, despite the fact that it gets Ember, Flamethrower, and Fire Blast. I head back to Follower town and exchange the meteorite for the return TM. If you look on the right hand side of the screen right now it says that returns base power is 71. That might confuse you if you've seen previous emerald videos because usually it is higher than that after I defeat Flannery. The reason is that all Pokemon have a base friendship value, that is the friendship that they have when you obtain the Pokemon. For instance a Pokemon like Slacking, which I ran last week, has a base friendship of 70. That value gives return an initial power of 28. As a pseudo legendary Pokemon, Salamence starts with half this amount of base friendship, so 35, giving return only 14 base power to start with. And the other reason is the slow growth rate. Leveling increases friendship, so with a slow growth rate, my friendship also grows slightly slower. Just a brief aside with a small factoid, I was recently talking with Speedrunner0218 about Pokemon Platinum, and he mentioned to me that Bunny Ray starts with a base friendship of zero. I genuinely could not believe this, that seemed so strange to me, so I looked it up, and yes, this is in fact the case. By the way, if you catch yourself a low punny, it starts with a base friendship of 140. Like, I understand that low punny evolves when it has high friendship, but does Bunny Ray just like really not want to be friends with anyone? I don't understand. Also, I thought that this was maybe something they had implemented for happiness evolutions. Turns out, no. Bunny Ray is the only Pokemon that is a non-legendary that has base friendship of zero. Alright, so coming back to a game that I am currently playing on the channel, let's talk more about Emerald. Next, I am going to have to face Norman. To prepare for this fight, I give Salamence a Chesto Berry just so I counter yawn strategies. And now I'm ready, let's do this Norman. Will Salamence be able to go 5 for 5 in gym battles? Honestly, I think it will. Up first is Spinda. It could have confused me here because Headbutt surprisingly does not knock it out in a single hit, but it goes for Facade, doing very little, and I finish it off. Next is Vigoroth. By the way, check out that video from last week if you haven't already seen it. I cause a flinch and knock it out. Moving on to the Linoon. This thing loves to use Belly Drum on the first turn it's in battle, so it fails after I hit with Headbutt and I knock it out for free. Moving on to his Ace Slacking. So far, this has been very easy easy. Now the slacking knows counter, so I want to use a special move so that I don't get hit on the first turn. This works out for me. Then when it's loafing around, I can use headbutt for more damage. The next move that slacking gets, it chooses yawn, so I am really happy that I have the chesto berry instead of the person berry. I heal my status, slacking heals with the citrus berry. I just want to emphasize here that I am actually successfully playing around counter. Usually at some point in this fight, I make a mistake and get a silly reset. Now, if you have been watching very carefully, or you're really good at Pokemon, you will have realized that I am making a mistake in this fight. What I should be doing is instead of using Ember for special damage, I should be using Bite for special damage. Number one, Bite has a 30% chance to flinch, which could cause the slacking to do nothing. Also, Ember has a 10% chance to cause a burn, and it does. This means that the base power of Facade is doubled whenever slacking uses it. It does eventually go for this move, and it doesn't do that much damage, so I had to look it up. And in Generation 3, 4, and 5, Burn's effect on having damage by physical moves is still calculated in the case of Facade. In the case of Guts, however, it is not. So this Facade that just hit me is essentially just base 70 power. It's slightly different in the damage calculation to have damage rather than having the base power, but overall that is just splitting hairs. The difference is very small. So because of how Facade works, the burn is actually advantageous to me because it stacks up every turn when the slacking is not moving, and as a result, Salamence takes a first attempt victory. Okay, it has gone 5 for 5 in Gym Leaders, 
this thing is absolutely tearing through the game. Norman's badge gives me a 10% boost to my defense stat, so there's only one more badge boost that I don't have access to yet, and that's the special attack and defense boost that I'll get after defeating Tate and Liza. After completing Norman, usually the Pokemon I'm running gets access to one or two great new moves through TM and HM. I'm thinking like Ice Beam, Thunderbolt, or Surf. For Salamence, it unfortunately does not gain access to anything for the next little while. That being said, it can start working towards the Flamethrower TM, which is purchased in the game corner. It costs roughly 80,000 Poké Dollars, and to speed my progress up in obtaining that money, I can head back to Little Root Town, talk to the player's mother, and obtain the Amulet Coin. This is available after you defeat Norman, and I have never used used it before in a playthrough, so I'm really happy that I remembered today. By the way, thank you for letting me know about this item in the comments, I really appreciate it. As I left Little Root Town, a question popped into my mind, which is, why does your mother give you the amulet coin? Perhaps uh, she needs you to earn money for the family, because your dad is just off at the gym obsessed with battling other trainers. Are gym leaders like salaried positions, or are they like volunteer positions within the community? Either way, Norman is definitely the most competent dad within Pokemon. Actually, that's not entirely true, Ditto does exist. The rival outside of Fort Tree City is next, and this one isn't difficult as well. The prize for winning this battle is the HM for Fly. When I was recording this video, I actually didn't realize where you get Fly. In Emerald version, it just sort of appears in your bag, and then you're like, oh, this is nice, I can use this after I defeat Winona. As I head towards her gym, let's examine what my moveset options are at this point in the run. My Salamence is level 36, so it's approaching 38, where it's going to learn Dragon Breath. Rock Tomb is also theoretically good against Winona, that is, if it doesn't miss. Ember is a great move to counter or her Skarmory, so really on my set, the only move that's useless is Bite. I didn't want to teach Fly at this point to lose coverage. That being said, Ember isn't the best option, because I can now teach Hidden Power in its place to get a base 70 power electric move. If you're wondering why I'm keeping Bite around, the answer is I'm not. Right before I face Winona, I teach Return in its place. I give Salamence the Silk Scarf, and with that, let's head into our 6th gym battle. Up first is Swablu, this thing does not have the dragon typing, so I can use Hidden Power to one-shot it. Next is Altaria, which is a dragon type, so I'm going to use Dragon Breath for super effective damage. It doesn't do enough to KO, the Altaria eats its Orinberry. Yes, it has an Orinberry instead of a Citrus Berry. Because it used Dragon Dance, it's able to hit Salamence with a Dragon Breath, but my next one finishes it off, and from there, things should be easier. Tropius is slow, because it's part Grass type, I use Hidden Power followed by Return to knock it out. Then she sends in Pelipper, which of course wastes my time with Protect. Hidden Power knocks it out, and I make it to the Skarmory. Electric moves are obviously super effective, there's no problems here, so Salamence, continuing its spree, it is now 6 for 6 in gym battles. The prize for defeating Winona is the TM for Aerial Ace, and this is largely why I did not teach Fly earlier in the run. Aerial Ace has base 60 power and it bypasses accuracy checks, whereas Fly takes 2 turns, has base 70 power, and only has 95% accuracy. Plus it is affected by moves like Sand Attack and Double Team. If I can avoid using Fly, I would really like to. I hate it when moves miss, so let's teach Aerial Ace in the place of Rock Tomb. The next major battle is against Maxi. We trade Intimidates once again to start things off, and then I use Dragon Breath because now my special attack is higher than my physical attack. Mightyena decides that that is not okay though, it uses Swagger boosting my attack stat, and I heal the confusion with a Person Berry. I finish the Mightyena off, he sends it Camera up next. I don't have a great option here, I should have gone for Aerial Ace, but return crits and knocks it out in one hit. Last is Crobat, which moves first because I got hit by a Scary Face. Confuses Salamence, causing one turn of self-inflicted damage, but that's not enough for Maxi to win. I fly to Slateport City because I no longer forget the fact that I have to go here in my playthroughs. I'm feeling quite comfortable playing this game at this point. I defeat Mad and the Team Aqua Hideout, and then I head towards Moss Deep City. I stop at Pacific Log Town to both get the fly point as well as to get the second TM for return, and then I head into the Moss Deep Gym to face Tate and Liza. And this is important because despite teaching return just a little while ago, I actually want to get rid of it right away to teach Salamence Steel Wing. With that moveset update, I think the cards are stacked in Salamence's favor going into the double battle. Tate and Liza lead with Claydol and Zatu. I didn't want to get rid of Hidden Power here, just because it hits the Zatu for super effective damage. Notably, despite the fact that I'm a flying type, the Claydol is still going to go for Earthquake on the first turn, which makes absolutely no sense. 
Hidden Power takes the Zatu back down to orange health, and then the Clay Doll uses Light Screen. Alright, that was a good play. Instead of using special moves, I should use physical moves now, so I finish the Zatu off with Aerial Ace. By the way, I am not targeting the Clay Doll because I don't think that it is particularly scary. They send in Lunatone, Clay Doll uses Psychic, which gets a special drop. Okay, that's not good. But things aren't over yet, I do have super effective damage against the Rock type Pokemon, so there is no risk of Hypnosis. Clay Doll hits another Psychic, taking Salamence down to orange health and triggering my Citrus Berry. I use Steel Wing on the Soul Rock, it just barely survives because it is more physically defensive in comparison with the Lunatone. Claydol continues to use Psychic, taking Salamence down to I think the lowest health it has been at in this entire run. I wanted to knock out the Claydol next because it has the higher special attack stat, but Dragon Breath does pathetic damage, and as a result, the Soul Rock uses Psychic and Salamence faints for the first time in this playthrough. Here's the thing, this Pokemon is so good, let's just use some rare candies now, boost its level up to say 50 and try the fight again. I was hoping this would give me the damage range to one-shot the Zatu, and in this in this case it does, but not because of the level, because of a critical hit instead. The fact that I was able to knock it out right away is actually kind of a disadvantage for the speedrun, because Zigzagoon levels up a bunch and I have to go through a bunch of move learning dialogue. Ah, anyways. Once that's over, they send in Lunatone, Claydol uses its predictable Earthquake, and then I use Steel Wing to finish the Rock type off in one hit. So I've made it back to the Soul Rock, this time with a higher level, and I can now get the one hit. All that's left is Claydol, but it's not very intimidating when it's by itself. I go for Aerial Ace, which does more than half, and as a result, Salamence is able to win on its second attempt. This badge gives it a 10% boost to its special attack and special defense stats. Defeating Maxi and Tabitha alongside Steven Stone is very trivial, and so is the fight against Archie at the end of the plot. In Sutopolis City, I surf to the left and grab the TM for Brick Break. This seems like a weird move for Salamence to learn, but I'm not going to complain about it. It is nice to have super effective damage against Sydney, as well as Steven at the end of the game. By the way, I do also have the TM for Earthquake right now, but it's usually not that useful during the League portion of the playthrough, so I'm saving it. Another move that really isn't that good at this portion of the game is Steel Wing, so I'm going to put the much more flexible return in its place. Now, the gym leader that I have been most worried for is next. It's time for Juan. The reason he is so scary for Salamence is because this is the first major battle where the opponent has Ice-type moves. Granted, only two of his Pokémon have them. Number one is the Celio in the form of Aurora Beam, and number two is the Kingdra, which he does send in second. And this one knows Ice Beam. Luckily for me though, I have Dragon Breath, which is super effective. That being said, I just barely do not have enough damage to knock it out in a single hit. As a result, Ice Beam hits Salamence for four times damage, Want heals the Kingdra, but I'm able to finish it off and move on to the following Celio. Hidden Power Electric is the best choice here, of course, and surprising to me, it does not get the one hit. Celio uses Aurora Beam, and Salamence has its second reset. I went into that previous fight with a Person Berry because that is by far the best default item for Juan. If the Love Disc confuses you with either Sweet Kiss or Water Pulse, then it doesn't matter. But with Salamence, I'm just knocking it out in one turn, so the item that makes more sense is the Silk Scarf. This is going to boost the damage of Return and hopefully give me the one hit against the Celio. But this time things play out completely differently. The Kingdra doesn't go for Ice Beam, instead prioritizing setup with Double Team. I do not miss, and I finish it for free. That means I am going to survive Aurora Beam no matter what what happens. I didn't try to go for a return for the damage range, I just knocked the Celio out with two hits from Hidden Power Electric, and from there, the fight gets much easier. Whiskash doesn't really have anything good, it just goes for Amnesia and I finish it off in two hits, and then the final Crawdont goes down to a single Hidden Power Electric. Alright, not bad, Salamence clears the gym portion of the game with only two resets, in a time under an hour and 30 minutes. Now there's going to be a spoiler for some of the other December releases. This time is good, but it is not nearly as good as Metacham. And for Salamence, there is still a lot of game remaining, things can still go very wrong. I want to prepare as much as is possible for the coming battles, so I head to Fall Arbor Town because I want to go to Meteor Falls. But before I do that, I want to stop by this water. Waterfall. If you go to the top, you can pick up a rare candy. I didn't know about this one for the longest time. Thank you so much for letting me know about this in my Patreon Discord server. I really appreciate it. Inside of Meteor Falls, I'm going to grab one item, which is the TM for Dragon Claw. While Salamence does learn this naturally at level 79, there is no way I am getting to that level in this playthrough with a slow growth rate. That is, unless Steven is really bad, but I'm not expecting that. To prepare for the league, I teach Salamence Brick Break in the place of Hidden Power. Then I use rare candies to boost it all 
all the way to level 63. If you're wondering why I'm making this decision, I discussed it in depth during my Aramaldo playthrough, but overall with powerful Pokemon, I think that this is the better approach for the best possible real time in a first attempt. The reason I felt this was safe is because I have Earthquake, Brick Break, and Flamethrower in order to defeat Steven, so I'm not really worried about that fight to the level that I would be with a Pokemon like Vigoroth or Slacking. During the use of these rare candies, I have the chance to learn the move Crunch. This is a fantastic counter to Phoebe's team, so I'm going to learn it in the place of Dragon Breath. Okay, it is time to face the Elite Four. First is Sydney, and I basically have everything that Salamence could dream of here. The White Herb counters Intimidate, I can use Brick Break to knock the Mighty Ann out in a single hit. Next he sends in his Absol, likely because it has the move Rock Slide, but Brick Break does more than enough damage to one hit. Next he sends in Shift Tree, it loves Double Team, so Aerial Ace is the counter to it, as well as the following Cacturn. All that remains is Crawdont, which I easily one-shot. Alright, so far so good, Phoebe is next. I'm holding the Black Glasses for this fight. Also, I use Return on the first Dusclops on turn 1, just so that pressure doesn't lower Crunch's PP. I want to ensure that every time I attack with that move, it is getting useful damage in. Horace Dusclops does survive a Crunch, as is to be expected, this thing is so bulky, but it doesn't have good attacking stats, so even when it uses Ice Beam, it does less than half. With it out of the way, her remaining Pokemon are significantly less intimidating. The Sableye also likes Double Team, which is another reason Aerial Ace is good, so Phoebe is defeated. I have made it to Glacia. This is theoretically Salamence's worst nightmare. She's an ice type trainer. All of her Pokemon have ice type moves. I really need one hits here. And Brick Break hopefully we'll be able to secure them. And in this case, it is. I make it to the second Celio, which also goes down to one hit. I think at this point, the only Pokemon that's going to survive is the Wall Rain. As expected, the second Glalie goes down. She sends in her ace. I use Brick Break, and yes, it survives on red health. It chooses Ice Beam, which gets the same type attack bonus and does four times damage. Salamence survives on one hit point. I could not believe it, so yeah. I beat Glacia on my first attempt. Next is Drake, and theoretically I have a type disadvantage and advantage here. He doesn't have any Pokemon with ice type moves, and I can teach Dragon Claw so that I have super effective damage for this battle. I don't play particularly well against the Shelgon because I use Return. I don't know why I'm doing that, I should be using Dragon Claw here. After all, look at the Shelgon's defense stat, it's 124. Its special defense is 72. Yeah, Dragon Claw would just be much better, because remember, all Dragon type moves deal special damage in Gen 3. Because of my misplay, I have my speed lowered, but I'm still faster than the Altaria, so I can knock it out with a single Dragon Claw, and I am tied with the Kingdra, but he doesn't send it in next. Instead, he chooses Flygon. Its Dragon Breath doesn't do much. I finish it, move on to the Salamence. It intimidates, uses Dragon Claw, dealing massive damage, but Salamence survives, hits its own Dragon Claw, and his ace goes down. Okay, so only Kingdra is left, and I just leveled up, which means I have more speed by one point. I go for Dragon Claw, and it crits. Salamence is able to get a clean sweep against the entire Elite Four. Granted, it did have luck on its side. But the champion is next, and he is a Water-type specialist, meaning his Pokémon have lots of Ice-type moves. This battle is likely going to be Salamence's greatest hurdle to overcome. For this battle, I have retaught Hidden Power Electric in the place of Aerial Ace. I go for it against the Wailord, hoping for the one hit so that I can dodge Blizzard. And Salamence crits! Okay, that is a good start. Next is Tentacruel. It has significantly lower physical defense, so I go for Return. Unfortunately, this just barely does not do enough damage. Tentacruel uses Ice Beam, and it does more than half. I recover some health with the Citrus Berry. Wallace uses a full restore, but it doesn't save Tentacruel. Next he sends in Milotic, it also has Ice Beam. Hidden Power Electric doesn't even do half. I probably should have used Return there. Either way, the luck from the beginning of the battle with my critical hit balances out here, because this time the Milotic crits. I think for that battle I made a moveset mistake. If I have Earthquake in the place of Return and Aerial Ace still, then I have super effective damage against the Tentacruel as well as the Ludicolo. Plus using the Soft Sand, Earthquake is going to be doing more damage than Return against the Milotic. This does mean I have to use it against the Wailord, which doesn't get the KO, but luckily it just goes for Rain Dance. Wallace uses one of his healing items here, which is great. Then, against the 
Tentacruel I can one shot and my Lodic comes back out. With full health I am feeling much more confident. Earthquake and Ice Beam both do more than half, but I'm faster so my Lodic gets taken out. And then Wallace sends in Gyarados. I don't really have a good move for this thing, it would really be nice to have an electric type attack. As a result I'm only able to do half and I don't have enough health to survive. Okay so the Ludicolo is not that good against my typing, I think Earthquake and Hidden Power Electric are going to be the better two moves. This means I can knock out the Milotic, then one shot the following Gyarados, and move on to Wallace's final two Pokemon, both of which do not have an ice move. Ludicolo's next, Dragon Claw does more than half, it sets up double team, but this doesn't prevent a move, so it faints. Last is Whiskash, it tries for a Surf, which does surprising damage due to a critical hit, but Salamence survives on red health and in doing so it defeats the champion. So its league finish results are a real time of 1 hour 41 minutes and 58 seconds, 4 resets at level 66, and a game time of 6 hours and 14 minutes. So now let's prepare for the final fight in the run. To do this, I head to the SS Tidal. On the SS Tidal's lower deck, I can dodge some trainers and then get caught by the guy anyways. A little bit frustrating. Anyways, in this trash can, I grab the leftovers. After that, I head to the game corner, buying myself the TM for Flamethrower. And finally, before the fight, I teach Rest and Flamethrower. These moves in combination with Earthquake, Brick Break, and the leftovers should be what I need for Steven. Steven's first Pokemon is Skarmory. It's really not that scary because I'm going to intimidate it, so it's not doing that much damage. Flamethrower knocks it out in two turns, and next he sends in Claydol. My best option against it is using Flamethrower, but it does a quarter. Okay, that's not very good. The Claydol is known for setting up screens, and it can also only hit Salamence with Ancient Power. It's not doing very much, so I'm not worried about this battle. It just takes time because Steven has full restores. I make what I think is a critical misplay here by not healing. I really should have done this, because once I knock the Claydol out, then I don't have free healing against the Cradley. After all, that thing was going to run out of Ancient Power soon. Against Cradley, I go for Brick Break. I thought this was going to do more damage. It only does half. And then Steven's Pokemon gets a critical hit, and Salamence goes down. I can just play that better and arrive at the Cradley with full health. Note for this fight that I have Dragon Claw and I don't have Brick Break. I was using Dragon Claw to knock out the Claydol. Then I can use Earthquake to 3-shot the Cradley and move on to the Armaldo. Earthquake's doing more than a third. Armaldo uses Ancient Power and it does so much damage. Salamence faints. Okay, so that's not good. I make it back to the Armaldo with full health, but I'm confused. Salamence hits itself. Ancient Power does not KO this time, but Salamence hits itself again, and that's another loss. I continue getting resets here. I tried different strategies, like for example, Iron Tail, but this isn't working, so I need to go and train. Remember at the beginning of the video when I said that Salamence doesn't learn Dragon Dance? It's only an egg move for it. Yeah, if I had Dragon Dance in this situation, I would easily be able to make it through Steven's team. The last Lack of a setup move is one factor that's really hurting it here. Something else that is hurting it is the fact that I used rare candies earlier in the run. If I was, say, four levels higher, this fight would probably be a little bit easier, but it wouldn't be that much easier. Also, if I had used the rare candies earlier on, I wouldn't have got by Glacia. I probably would have had a reset to Drake, and the champion would have been much harder. This is why I don't really mind with strong Pokemon using the rare candies earlier on. After all, I can just be a little bit more decisive with my plays and minimize resets early into the playthrough. Then it's Steven, if I really do need to, I can train. And in this case I level up to 69, I collected one more rare candy from the Safari Zone, which I can use now to bring Salamence to level 70 before I face Steven again. Using the Iron Tail strategy I make it back to the Armaldo, I go for it and it just barely isn't getting the one hit at this level. Because Steven uses a full restore, I switch up my move ordering going for Flamethrower first and then Iron Tail. Next is Agron, Brick Break does 4 times damage, I finish it off, and I have made it to Steven's final Pokemon. I feel like this is the perfect Pokemon for Salamence to have to face at the very end of the run. It's the complimentary Generation 3 pseudo-legendary, and as is only fitting, I will be doing a run with it tomorrow. Stay tuned, I am very excited. But how will Salamence do against it? Well, I go for Flamethrower, it does more than half. Metagross uses Meteor Mash, Salamence survives, Metagross eats his Citrus Berry, I use Flamethrower, and it just barely doesn't knock out. That is one of the most painful damage ranges. If the Metagross didn't have a Citrus Berry, or I did like two more damage, it would have gone down. I was pretty sure that Salamence was going to do this. I kept attempting, and I kept getting resets, not making it back to the Metagross. In the end, I resigned myself to the fact that I needed to train more, and I come back to face Steven Stone at level 73. This has to be enough. I two-shot the Skarmory, knock out Claydol slowly using Flamethrower, 
Thrower and Brick Break, as well as Rest to ensure that I have good health for the following Pokemon. And then I can use Brick Break to knock out the Cradley and Armaldo. But against the Aggron, I do something slightly different. Its moveset is kinda bad, Thunder, Earthquake, Solar Beam, and Dragon Claw. These are good moves, but Aggron does not have good special attack. And all the moves that it can actually attack Salamence with are special, so I'm just going to heal with Rest a bunch, depleting its PP, and eventually it's going to start missing with Thunder or trying to use Solar Beam. In doing this, I'm able to give Salamence green health for the final Metagross. I go for Flamethrower, it does just a little bit more than half, Metagross hits Meteor Mash, I will not survive another one of those, it eats its Citrus Berry, and then I got very worried. Please, Flamethrower, do enough damage. And in this case, it does. So Salamence clocks in with its first playthrough results. It gets a real time of 2 hours, 29 minutes, and 7 seconds, with 17 resets of level 73. This was a game time of 8 hours and 1 minute. Comparing these real-time results with all the other Pokemon that I have run to date, this run was largely simple until the late game, which is to be expected. I started the game with a fully evolved Pokemon. Obviously, the early portions of the game are easy when you're using a Dragon type. This run is best described as getting more difficult progressively throughout the playthrough. And due to its typing, it's going to struggle more in the late game, where there is a higher density of water and ice types. Also, any Pokemon that lacks setup moves against Steven really is going to struggle, and Dragon Dance is sorely missed here. Because of this, Salamence's results are really not that good. It gets a time that is significantly slower than Breloom, and only slightly faster than Aerodactyl. You might wonder if those are fair comparisons, did I play worse with Salamence? And no, I had 40 resets with Breloom and 22 with Aerodactyl, so Salamence had the lower reset count. If we rank it based on game time, then it is slower than Cradley, and faster than Slacking. It took me a little bit of time to figure out the strategy against Steven Stone, but I don't think that player error error is the reason that Salamence did not do well. I think this Pokemon is just not designed for success within a Hoenn game. The slow growth rate, and the fact that the late game is the hardest section for it, means that the cards are just stacked against it from the very beginning. That is, if it does not have Dragon Dance. I'm sure with an egg move, this thing would absolutely crush Steven Stone at the end of the game. As I mentioned before, I'm going to be playing Metagross tomorrow so that we can compare these two pseudo-legendaries. Also, that is going to be my last Pokemon Emerald video of the entire year. What could be a better finale than the epic Steel Psychic type? If you made it this far in the video, you are incredible. If you support me on Patreon or through YouTube memberships, thank you for making my dreams come true. I'll see you tomorrow for Metagross.